Hello everyone, this is Chris Peterson again. I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about attacking chess. One of my most favorite things to do, no matter what kind of chess I play, whether it's blitz, bullet, slow chess, whatever, is attack. And one of my favorite players of all time, no surprise, is a fantastic attacking player. And his name might not be too familiar to you, although you may have heard it, is Rashid Nazmetinov. For about three years, I played chess competitively, and over those years, I kind of naturally developed into an attacking player. And a friend of mine, Daoud Zupa, who is a chess history buff, um, would always compare my style to other players throughout history. You know, people like Paul Morphy and Alexander Alyekin, and Rashid Nazmetinov, who I had never heard of at the time. And after I did a little research, I found out that he was this awesome attacking player who always had these crazy tactical games that I I really like to just you know play through. The reason why Nesmetnov is not as well known as he should be is because he was trapped behind the Iron Curtain of the Soviet regime. He was only allowed to play in one international tournament in his entire chess career. It wasn't until he was 42 he was awarded his international master title from FIDE which goes to show his chess career didn't really take off until later on in his life. But throughout his chess career, he won the Russian Championships five times, and he had a plus score against world-class players like Mikhail Tall and Bronstein. He wasn't just all about chess. He was also a world-class checkers player. And at one point, if I'm not mistaken, he was both the Russian champion of chess as well as checkers, which is a feat only accomplished by him. One of the reasons this game is so intriguing is Pologaevsky, who later on became famous for his ability to calculate variations in tactics. So we got this crazy attacking player Nazmetinov versus the insane calculator Pologaevsky. By insane calculator, I mean Pologaevsky was known for calculating very long variations very accurately. And the main difference between Pulagaevsky and Nezmetinov is Pulagaevsky was content to play positions that were more quiet than tactical. Now, I didn't want to go into detail in the opening, simply because this is more of a tribute to Nezmetinov's tactical prowess than a complete analysis on the game. So I just want to get to the point where the tactics become most prominent in the game. And here we are. In this position, white is under tremendous pressure from black's actively placed pieces, and he is hard pressed to find a good defense. White's last move, rook to h1, was an attempt to win this bishop on h6 through a skewer. Pologaevsky was on the right track in trying to defend this position. Instead of rook h1, however, if he had played a3 to remove this active b4 knight, he would have had a much better chance at defending this position. So let's go back to the actual game. Pulagaevsky played rook h1, and if we take a look here, black's queen is in a little bit of trouble, and he might be losing his bishop on h6. But white's king being in the center makes it vulnerable as well. And as we all know, kings are worth much more than queens. So in order to exploit white's king being in the center, Rashid played a brilliant sacrifice, rook takes f4. What makes this sacrifice so amazing is that it gives white the choice of what black wants to sacrifice, either his queen or his rook. So I wanted to take a look at a couple of the obvious variations here. The first line I want to cover is the pawn takes rook line, and after bishop takes f4, knight takes f4, knight takes c2 is going to win white's queen because black's king has nowhere to go and black should be easily winning this position. So let's go back and I wanted to look at one other variation here for white. After knight takes f4, queen takes g3 is going to lead to a checkmate. After king g4, surprising move b5 threatening c5 check and knight c6 checkmate. White has to play bishop d3. After queen f2 check, king c3, 
Knight f3, another surprising quiet move threatening queen d4 mate. King takes b4, a5 check, king takes b5, queen c5 check, and finally queen b4 checkmate. So finally we're on to the variation that I'm sure most of you are wondering about. Rook takes h2. Now in this position black has a very strong double check, rook f3 check, which forces white's king further up the board to d4. Now in this position black has several ways he can continue, um, including c5 check or c6. Whether black plays c5 check or c6, the best response is pawn takes. And after b5, black is threatening knight e takes c6 checkmate. So white has to respond bishop d3. Then after knight e c6 check, king c3, bishop g7 check, king d2, rook takes d3 check, king e1. Uh, black has two ways to continue here. Either he can take the bishop on d2, or the simpler way to win is just to take the queen here.